Last week I introduced us to a couple named Jerry and Cynthia, both of whom had placed their faith in God through Jesus Christ and had a desire to be good Christians, had a desire to walk in him. Both of them served in their church selflessly, but both of whom were discontent because the lives that they thought they should have in Christ seemed to be nowhere to be found. Love and joy and peace were starting to feel like empty promises to them. And they were discouraged. We talked a little bit about what may be wrong. And Jerry and Cynthia had a problem. They had adopted a new life, but they hadn't let go of the old. I just want you to sit in the pews and think a little bit about yourself for a minute. Because before we find Christ, we still want fulfillment. Before we find Christ, we still want purpose in life. Before we, st- want Christ, before we find Christ, we still seek love and joy and peace and all of those things, but we seek them from sources that can only provide them temporarily, that usually leave us uh, broken and empty. I want you to think about before you found Christ, where did you look for those things? Where did you seek out those, that kind of fulfillment before Christ? Some of you from my generations, it was drug, sex, and rock and roll. That was our mantra, okay? Drug, sex, and rock and roll. How many looked for it in work? Anybody look to find those things at your workplace? Go ahead, raise your hand. Confession's good for this all, okay? There's probably a lot of things that we could put onto that list. How many can you actually say that all of those things are totally gone from your life and you have them in perfect balance today as a believer? Okay. Got one guy. Wow. <laughs> I want you to stand because I just come up, man, because we're going <laughs> to. I know. I know. They, Cynthia and Jerry, had never fully embraced the concept of death to self so that Christ could live through them. They were not living as new creations, having put to death the old man. (laughs) To quote a line from The Princess Bride, they weren't dead, they were just mostly dead. Okay. When we become Christians, whatever aspect of the old self that remains subterfuges what is good and engages what is bad. So let's review. Take your Bibles and join me in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. We just sang the song, All I am in heaven ever hope to be, which is what we strive for. Christ, all that I am, all that I have, all that I ever hope to be. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, if you're a Christian, if you've given your life to Christ, if you've trusted him as your Lord and your Savior, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. And we pointed out that Jerry and Cynthia were doing that. This is where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your minds on things that are above. And Jerry and Cynthia did that well too. But this is where they fell short, not on things that are on earth. They still had things in their life that at times were more important to them than God. And now Paul goes on to remind the the church in Colossae, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your what? When Christ, who now is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now last week we noted that this teaching about the death of our old self or those aspects of our being that are embracing all of those parts of our old life that did not bring glory to God was like an arborist who prunes off 
shoots and branches that will rob the tree of its vitality and limit its ability to bear fruit. By the way, you might want to notice that if you've ever seen a tree that has really, that an arborist has really gone after and pruned, is it beautiful or ugly after he's done? Man, it is a stick, okay? But if he never did that, that tree would look lush and green. And anybody who walked by would say, wow, what a beautiful tree. After the arborist gets done with it, they say, man, what happened to that tree? It must be diseased, okay? But then, once the shoots start to come, okay, which will then be the fruitful branches on the tree, then it looks absolutely gorgeous. Likewise, we compare our lives, I did last week, to a hard drive that over the years has had all sorts of viruses, malware, spyware, startup functions, spams, adware, unused cookies, search histories, and on and on and on and on and on. And we've downloaded all this stuff into our life. Some of it's terrible because it came from sites that we never should have been on to begin with. And those things got snuck in and we didn't even know about them. And other things we put on, nothing innately evil about them. They're just sitting there now, not doing anything, but taking up space and having functions in, on, on our hard drive that just are, are wasting our own energy, okay? Some of it is vile and disgusting, and some of it simply inane. By the way, that's one of those words I wrote down, I thought after I wrote it, do I know what that means? So I looked it up, and it was just what I wanted. It's a waste of time, empty and unsubstantial, okay? Got anything in your life that's a waste of time? Really rather empty? And, uns and unsubstantial in terms of the bigger picture of things. This is what I get off of television most of the time, okay? I might have been entertained to a certain degree, but man, pretty inane stuff. But none of which, this stuff that's on our hard drives, is necessary anymore because we've been given a new life in Christ that is animated by the Holy Spirit. And I believe I explained that the Holy Spirit is like a download of comprehensive, infinite programming, which is perfect and virus-free, okay? That's the Holy Spirit. I mean, if somebody came up to you and says, hey, I've got this software, every portion of software you will ever need in your life, entertainment included, okay? And you will never have any viruses with it. It will protect you fully, okay? Uh, and it's free. Would you want it if it's true? Well, of course we would, okay? Uh, this is why Satan works so hard to discourage us. Verse five, verse five of our text. Put to death, and this is where we, this is we ended uh, on verse four last week. Put to death, therefore. Remember, whenever you see a therefore, you gotta look back and see what it's there for. Those first verses is what this is referring to. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. I'm going to read through these and just make commentary as we go. But these earthly things that we're told to put to death or prune or delete are the things we do have downloaded in the past in hopes that they would be the answer to our emptiness and our need and desire to worship something bigger than ourselves. And it might seem strange to say, but all of these things that we tend to worship, meaning we center our lives around them, making them of utmost importance in our lives, in time, we find that they are fickle friends and become the onus for much pain and disappointment and disillusionment and sadness and hurt. And almost all of that stuff in our lives can be traced back to those things. And verse 6 simply says, on account of those things, the wrath of God is coming. Okay? Those are the things that... Uh, make God put the whistle in his mouth and say, I'm going to blow it. And when I blow it, everybody better get out of the pool because it's over. Okay. 
Verse 7. In these things, Paul tells the Christians in Colossae, you too once walked when you were living in them. Okay, and what we need to do when we read this is we've got to go back to what were we living in that was not Christ. But now, he says, you must put them all away. This doesn't come as a divine suggestion. This is just to live a new life in Christ. You must put them away. Now, He's referring to a different list when he says this, not the previous one, but a new one. In these things, he's about to tell us what these things are when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. What's he talking about now? Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Note that this list is a bit different from the list above. This list is the rotten fruit that grows in our lives when we worship the wrong things. Things that promised us so much and gave us so little. A life that has been dissipated by sexual immorality, dissipated by various impurities, dissipated by misplaced passions, dissipated by evil desires, and dissipated by covetousness. And they leave behind a spirit that is often angry and sometimes malicious and even slanderous and that thinks and speaks in obscenities. One of the things I've shared before is <clears throat> our thought life is a very, very critical part of our being. And uh, all of our being needs to be given over to the Holy Spirit. And sometimes I have thoughts. And sometimes the thoughts reflect my emotions. And how do I know? I, have, I just have this thing, I know when my thoughts are of Dave Hutchins and when my thoughts are of the Lord. And the way, the, reason I, the way I identify the two has to do with the kind of words that come to mind. Because I've never, I, I can just tell you, I've never had a problem speaking obscenities out loud. It's never really been a big temptation for me. But man, they're up here. Anybody who's worked on work crews or worked out in the world, or, or you know, they're just there. And when obscenities come to my mind, that tells me this is not the Lord, this is this is not the Holy Spirit. This is Dave Hutchins. And this thinking is errant. Okay? And my obscenities are my warning that my thinking is errant and I need to readjust and get back underneath the influence of God himself. Now verse 9 says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, why verse 11? I think upon a first reading, you wonder, what, that's, what is that there for? Uh, what do these categories of humanity have to do with putting the godless aspects of our lives to death? Okay. Why does he say, here is not Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, barbarian Scythian, slave, free? Uh, here's why that he added that. These are all the things he has talked about. Uh, whether from the old man and the results of the old man, of our former lives, all of them have a significant, a, a very significant effect upon relationships. Okay? And these are often the things that divide us in Christ when we give ourselves over to them. Satan's lies are intended to divide and to conquer. Do not lie to one another. Get the church quarreling and set them at odds with one another and you will render the church impotent. 
the same is true for families. Get husbands and wives and children quarreling, not standing as one. And that family will not accomplish it what it will be able to accomplish if they did stand as one. The same is true in marriages. The same is true for any institution where Christ is the head or Christ is called out as the head. When we allow things of this world to vie for power and authority, then God's will for us will be hindered. Now, I want to talk a little bit about lying because that one verse will be a foundational verse for just about everything we're going to talk about in this series of sermons. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put on the old self, seeing that you have put, put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. The, our creator, the image that we carry, our creator is the God of truth. Everything about him defines what is true. His nemesis, Satan, whose power can't even begin to stand up to his, but under whose influence we struggle, is the liar. Satan battles Christ in our lives with lies. This is why he is given the title, the father of lies. This is why we are told that when he speaks, he speaks the language of deceit, okay? He was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. So we have some indication of how powerful his lies can be. At the root of everything the Bible tells us to cut off or kill is a lie. And this shouldn't surprise us because of the author of lies. He uses deceptions and lies to separate us from God who is truth to destroy us and to destroy the generations that will follow us. In fact, one might view lies like a malicious virus placed on your hard drive that will hinder your ability to function well. And like uh, Dave Emery taught me, uh, sometimes those lies are put on our hard drive and we don't even know it. And then they're hidden there. And I dare say everyone in this room has lies that are in play in your life that have been put in there at some time or some place that you are still, that are still part of your operating system that need to be rooted out, need to be found. <clears throat> give, you an ex give you an example, excuse me. Jesus tells us not to worry, okay? He tells us not to worry. The world tells us to worry about nothing at all, or to worry about absolutely everything, okay? And we do. <laughs> Research the word phobias, and you will find long lists of irrational, debilitating fears that cause people to worry so much that they simply cannot function. I dare say I know many, many Christians who cannot do what God has called them to do because they are bound by lies. And they worry about what might happen if they actually do what God wants them to do. It's not a matter of knowing what God wants them to do. It's a matter of doing it. Everything from anthrophobia, the fear of flowers, to zoophobia, the fear of animals. In fact, if you look up phobias, they will tell you there's no comprehensive list of phobias because people can be afraid of absolutely anything and it can overtake them. Sadly, these are real concerns whose victims suffer greatly, caught between a God who says go and sensibilities that won't let them because we're in bondage somehow. Lies are always found at the root of irrational fears. Satan uses fears to debilitate us. 
and this has proven to be an effective tool of bondage. (laughs) God comes to free us, right? And Satan, his nemesis, comes to put us in bondage. In his great commission, Jesus tells us what? I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you to the very end of this age. Now, how many phobias do you think can get in the way of that? It's quite a command, okay? Any of the following phobias would have kept me from serving the Lord in Mexico a few weeks ago. Eclophobia, fear of darkness. Acrophobia, fear of heights. Aerophobia, fear of flying. Algophobia, fear of pain. Agoraphobia, fear of open spaces or crowds. Amaxophobia, fear of riding in a car or a truck. Uh, Androphobia, fear of men. Anthrophobia, fear of people. Or, oh, anthropophobia, sorry, fear of people or society. Ataxophobia, fear of disorder or untidiness. Atelophobia, fear of imperfection. Atachipophobia, fear of failure. Autophobia, fear of being alone. Now those are just the A's, okay? But any of those would have kept me from going. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, do you know it? It's the way Ecclesiastes ends. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God. Not all those other things, fear God. Keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. I mean, God makes it so simple for us. 2 Timothy 1.7, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. All that other stuff is not of the Lord. Now, as we go through this series, we're going to be looking at a number of things, a number of lies that are commonly found in the church uh, that I think are holding us back to one degree or another. Not absolutely everybody will fall under these, but most of us will be hit by some of them. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the lie that says it's better to, to order your life around what people think than what God thinks. I just want to just the quick This is a confessional thing. How many of you in here think you care too much about what people think and not enough about what God thinks? Just raise your hand, okay? I mean, those of us who are wired as people pleasers, okay? And I'll tell you, that's a horrible position to be in, okay? We're gonna talk about the lie that says there's a definitive list of everything that everyone must put to death, okay? I gotta find out what I gotta put to death. I'm gonna go talk to the pastor. He's got a list in his office. And frankly, I see some things in some of your lives that are from your old life and you're not abusing them and they're an active part of your life now and you're now using them for the glory of God and it's not a problem. But I see others who have the same things active in their life and you haven't been able to figure out how to use them for the glory of God and they're dragging you down. We're going to talk about the lie that says my anger, my sadness, my jealousy, and my fears, they're not really a problem. Everybody's got those. It's not a problem for me. We're going to talk about the lie that says nothing's my fault. (laughs) Work work with anybody like that? Okay. We're going to talk about the lie there's nothing wrong with my thinking. We're going to talk about the lie, you know, you just can't do too much. And we're going to talk about the lie that says, I am indispensable. (laughs) A little bit of time, let's talk about lie number one. Pleasing people is more important than pleasing God.
God. Here's the question. Do you need the affirmation of others to feel good about yourself? I just want to, I mean, you've got to be real. I mean, everybody wants people to like them. We all want people to feel good about us. But do we need their approval to feel good about ourselves? Now, here's a definitive statement that I want you to get. If you don't walk away with anything today, walk away with this. There is only one person whose opinion is 100% right all of the time about you. Only one. Therefore, his opinion is the only opinion about you that really counts. Everybody else needs to get in line behind him. And this one person just happens to be, I should say, one God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. Okay. What we know about God's opinion of us is twofold. We are created in his image, and because we have been created in his image, this gives us inherent worth. You've heard me say this before, but man, Christian young people should not struggle with their self-esteem. They should know these things. You have inherent value simply because you have been created in the image of God. And two, uh, our identity as Christians is found in Christ. We are clothed with his righteousness, a righteousness from Jesus that allows us to access God the Father as sons and daughters, as princes and princesses of the living, eternal, and almighty God of all. That's us. God so loved us. God so valued us that he sent his only son to die on the cross so that we <laughs> could not just be saved for eternity, but so that we could be in relationship with him. If we know this about ourselves, if we know this about ourselves, why should we care about the opinions of sinful, flawed, prejudicial, flattering, bitter, angry, divisive people. Okay? Why do we give them power over our thoughts and actions? And part of me says when, we, when, we, when you step back from the forest and you look at the trees, this is no-brainer stuff. God's opinion is right. His is the opinion of cow. Why would we give so much weight to people who are wrong? And I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we shouldn't care at all about what people think about us. But we need that, but that amount of care needs to be assigned by God, not by us. So that it doesn't debilitate us from doing what God wants us to do in their lives. Why don't I talk to my friends at work about Christ? when I feel prompted to do so? Why don't I talk, about, why don't I talk to my neighbors or the people in my, my community about, about my faith in Christ when Christ prompts me to do so? Because I'm, because I'm worried about what they think about me? Because I want them to like me? And I know these are powerful forces in our lives. But God must be more powerful. And those are the kind, that kind of thinking is what needs to be put to death. You know, we're not alone in this struggle. Peter, on the night of Jesus' arrest, remember him? After they had sung a hymn in the upper room, after they had taken the Lord's Supper together, they went out to Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, uh, you will fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. 
but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And then Peter answered Jesus, though they fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. Now he was resolute. He believed that. What do you think it was that caused him to do what Jesus told him exactly what he was going to do? After this was written in, in uh, Matthew chapter 26, we find Jesus betrayed in the garden, Jesus arrested. Jesus is tried and sentenced to death. And in verse 69, now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, you were with Jesus the Galilean. A servant girl. There's no indication that he knew this girl at all. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know uh, what you mean. And then he went out to the entrance and saw another servant girl. And she said to the bystanders, this man w was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know this man. And after a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. And then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately he heard the rooster crow. I'm guessing everybody in this room knows that feeling. I, I, I did it again. I chose the world over God. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And how did that end up for Peter? He went out and he wept bitterly. And there we see the tough, fiery disciples upon whom Jesus had designated to lead the church in his absence, worrying about the opinion of two servant girls and a bunch of strangers hanging out on the streets of Jerusalem. And I just contend that that's not rational thinking on Peter's behalf. When do we allow what strangers think of us to keep us from doing what we ought to do? It's easy to be critical of Peter from a distance of time and culture, but how different are we really? Has saying yes to your boss ever caused you to say no to God? Has saying no to your spouse ever caused you to say no to God? Has picking up an expensive tab ever violated God's will for you, his steward? Have you ever not spoken up for truth because of what people may think? Because of how they might categorize you because of the names that they will call you? Do your friends, do your coworkers, your fellow students, your neighbors know that you're a Christian? Or have you, like Peter, denied your relationship with him, even if it's only through silence? The Bible is full of people who put the opinions of people over and above the opinions of God. Aaron had, construct, had been instructed to wait for Moses to come down from Mount Sinai, but fell to the pressure of the people and actually had a golden calf built for them to worship. <laughs> he cared more about the peop what the people wanted. The result was people turned away from God and worshipped the idol. Moses ended up having beg God not to kill them all. Abraham, scared of foreign kings, dishonored God and lied about being married to his beautiful wife, Sarah. Twice. What was the result of that? Well, Abraham lost face in the face of kings, but what do you think that did with his relationship to his wife? Reuben, Joseph's brother, was prone to kindness but fell under the pressure of his brothers and had Joseph sold into slavery and lied to their father Jacob, telling him Joseph was dead. Joseph got sold, spent years in slavery, and another broken, uh, 
another broken, uh, a, a brother broken, marked as liars and murderers, and Jacob the father's heart was broken. Now what we need to understand is how that story ends, because this is how the story ends for all of us. For what Satan and what he has done in our lives, what others meant for evil, God will use for good. Okay, God will use for good. And we learn our lessons. So this week, over this week, I'm going to ask you to give prayerful attention to your interactions with other people. I want you to try to begin to notice how many times you sacrifice optimum for the sake of what others may think. How much control do you really give other people over your actions, over your thoughts, over your life? Does your language conform to people and their personalities? Or does it conform to the beauty of God's heart? Does your calendar reflect God's schedule for your homework, school, and church? Or is someone other than God greater, a greater influence on your calendar? Does the spinning of your money reflect what God expects of you as his steward? Or does it reflect the values of the people around you? Well, and... If you're married and you have very close friends, ask them. Do some checking up on that. Okay? Do some self-evaluation. Because until the viruses are revealed, until they're found, it's going to be very hard to deal with them. Pray. Ask God to reveal these things to you. Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, your word tells us to trust in you with all of our heart and not lean on our own understandings. And Lord, that's my prayer for each of us this week, that we would trust in you. We would do what you lead us to do in all aspects of our lives, not just certain ones, Lord, but at work and at school and at church and in our neighborhood. Lord, with our spouses, with our children. Lord, we need your understanding. We need your mind. We need your heart. Ours will lead us astray. Lord, let us acknowledge you in all of our ways so that you can direct our paths. We give you thanks. And all God's people said, amen. amen.